here we have another specimen of all salamander, this being the dirt and mud salamander. The speckles on the back are starting to become more apparent as it rose in its rage and fury. Any moment now it will explode, so we must move away before it explodes. This episode is going to be so much freaking fun that I don't think I'm even going to be able to stand it. Um, of course, we've got the car giveaway going on right now for about the next few hours. So if you're lucky enough to see this, you know, now-ish, click on the screen right here. It'll take you over to enter the contest. Before it's over, we're giving away a car. And, uh, you know, we also have all these nice goodies. We've got some A-Data. Um, we've got an A-Data SSD, 512 gigabyte SSD to be, um, to be precise. We've got their brand new XPG version 3 memory with the custom blue just for us because we're using the Sapphire VaporX R9 290X. Um, you know, uh, graphics card things. That thing is insanely quiet. Did you see the video where I put that thing in in, in Wendell? I just uploaded it yesterday, but um, it is. Yeah, you can't. There's no sound. It's like I don't even understand that. It's the magic of the vapor vapor chamber. I, it's like ridiculous. I, I I was completely shocked. Running games. I mean, we we barely tested this thing. We just mainly I wanted to test that out. Um, you know, before the contest was over, just so you guys could see what this graphics card was. Dog's knocking on the door over there. Let the dog do that. But yeah, it's um, it's so quiet that it kind of bothers me. It's it's weird. It makes me feel like the fans are broken or something. You know, like it, it makes me want to take the side panel off just to make sure the fans are spinning. It's like that quiet. So um, anyway, we got the Fractal Node 804 Newton R3 thousand watt power supply. Uh, a couple of awesome products from Mayflower Electronics, like the Objective DAC and the uh, FileSex T50 RP version one headphones. Those are personally my favorite headphones they make. They're um. Sound profile is pretty much perfect for metal and rock and roll. Uh, maybe slightly analytical, but a little. It's like a mixture between an analytical sound and a um, hi-fi sound. So I like them a lot. And then also, you're getting a year of um, private internet access. Our favorite VPN. So, at least my favorite VPN. I don't know. Do you have a favorite BP, VPN right now, or not really? Just I like. I like your the own, favorite. Right? Uh, yeah, pretty much. I like VPNs that make things work properly again. You know what we need to do? We need mm -hmm. to do a. Uh, you need. We need to talk to the people at Private VPN and see if we can get like two week free codes, and then pass them out to all the people that are like, I, my connection is terrible, but I'm not sure that a VPN will make it better. Because you'd be surprised at how much your ISP is throttling. I mean, not always, but a lot of the time that's the case. Hmm. Yeah, we should call it Private Internet Access and see if they'll do that. That would be very, very interesting uh, for for viewers of the tech. All right, uh, let's see what else we got to talk about here in the news. I guess that's, uh, that's that, so go ahead and good luck on that. And I guess we'll jump right into it and start off with um, BitTorrent. They've unveiled some quote-unquote NSA-proof um, online calling and messaging software. It's a peer-to-peer -peer software that uh, is encrypted to the dickens, I suppose. It's called Bleep. And uh, this is the hardware science and technology episode um, with, and gaming. So um, we're just going to mention that and then move right, on, right along and get down to business with some hardware. 43 terabytes over over a single uh, fiber. Terabit. Terabit. When I said ter terabytes. <laughs> 43 terabit per second. Um, on one so fiber. Yeah. Now, when they say one fiber, do they mean one fiber optic cable or one fiber within that fiber optic cable? What do they mean by, by that? I believe that they meant one, one cable. But yeah. it's not really, like, there's a lot of fun things. I, we got some messages last time that were like, Oh, you know, stuff over, it's not necessarily duplex and blah, blah, blah. But this article is awesome because it shows you, like, so for, like, the transatlantic cables, where it actually would be a huge pain in the butt to run more fiber optic cables, they right. do a lot of really fancy stuff to squeeze as much as possible onto single fibers. And so they've done that here, too. They actually got, was it over a 1,000 terabit when you put in multiple frequencies and multiple uh, incident angles and things like that? Because there's a lot of stuff that you can do to stuff many 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 independent light streams on a single fiber cable when you're in a situation where like you've got one cable that goes across the transatlantic and you want to get stuff over there so this is why we need fiber to every structure in america or yeah, in the, the entire world so it's really awesome the guys at the university of denmark did this i mean it's uh, the, the one thing that, that i'll say about this of course we reported uh, what a couple of weeks ago that now you can do uh, or they, they were able to do 10 
uh, 10 gigabits per second over standard copper and we were like wow and then you were like well fiber is still still the thing and yes fiber is still the thing it's the 100 year infrastructure and the, and the beautiful thing about fiber is all you got to do is just change out the router on one end or the other and then you can upgrade the speeds using the existing infrastructure and uh, any company that argues against using fiber or, or start saying things like, hey, you know, we're just going to start putting 4G antennas on your house and then you can use that all around because that's all you guys really need is a 4G antenna on the roof, right? Um, no, that they're, they're trying to cut their costs and maximize their profits and they're not doing what is in the, um, the best interest of humanity for the future of the world. They're, they're trying to build a world that's going to be um, crippled when, you know, as technology moves forward, that's the one area that there are a lot of the major companies, like I'm talking Comcast and Verizon and these companies that are making a ton of money and just not upgrading their infrastructure, it's going to be a mess. Because right now it's already starting to be a mess with you know streaming services and that sort of thing. But I don't know, as technology moves forward, that's going to be a huge, uh, I guess, hurdle or a choke point. So anyway. The, the, thing that's, the thing that's really criminal with that is that right now, you know, the infrastructure is in place and is being rationed before it really should be rationed. But with another decade or so of no real infrastructure upgrades, um, then they, there really will be, you know, congestion and there really will be problems. But, you know, again, if there were a physical fiber optic infrastructure, the problem with physical connections really wouldn't be a big deal. Gigabit uh, fiber optic transceivers. So if you've got duplex fiber, that means there's a cable running to your house with a transmit and a receive fiber, which is not all that unusual anymore because fiber is pretty cheap. Um, in that situation, fiber optic transceiver, duplex fiber optic transceiver is like a $20 piece of equipment and that's running at a gigabit. So that's how low those prices have gotten. There's really no excuse for this infrastructure to not be everywhere. I mean, one of the reasons Estonia is so amazing is because they started their rewire in the eighties with fiber and now it's paying off in spades today. Man, Estonia. <laughs> Sony is beating us over there. It's crazy. All right, let's uh, let's talk about Tesla for just a little bit. And Elon Musk has been saying some some things, and uh, their stock's going up, and everything looks pretty good. Now they have Panasonic, um, and Panasonic has confirmed that they will be partnering with Tesla uh, for the new Gigafactory to produce the uh, the lithium ion batteries. It's going to be built in the USA. And um, the interesting thing here, as far as this goes, uh, in my opinion, is that Panasonic they bring a lot more to the table than just money. So. Uh, of course, they're going to make money and they're going to invest some money. I mean, I think $2 billion of this money is coming from Tesla uh, and other investors. And then, you know, it's a $5 billion factory, so I'm not sure where all the rest of the money is going to come from. Panasonic will probably throw some money at it. Uh, but Panasonic is going to bring expertise to the table because they've worked, um, you know, on battery technology for quite a long time. And that's going to alleviate a lot of the R&D on uh, Tesla's end, free up some of that money for other R&D or other purposes. So I think this is going to be a decent uh, partnership. And, uh, you know, I don't know if anything you want to say about that before we move on to talk about the, 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 car, the cars. I really, uh, Panasonic does bring a lot to the table for Musk, so this could be a powerhouse partnership. My only concern is that, you know, just the supply of lithium, it's not really, like, super rare, but considering that we want to put lithium in everything, that's maybe a problem. And Musk has said that, you know, he's committed to getting 100,000 electric teslas on the road by 2015 2016 i think that that what he means is what they've manufactured through the present day plus what they intend to manufacture in the next year to two years well, being on, over a hundred thousand teslas now here, here in this thing he says um a hundred thousand vehicles next year he wants to deliver one hundred thousand vehicles next year so it sounds like he wants to because this year they did they delivered uh, around uh, twenty two thousand in 2013 yeah, I saw and, in, in, this, in this article it said 100,000, but I saw another source and, he, and it made it sound like he was talking about 100, like doing 60 to 80,000 right. plus the 22,000 that are on the road now. So not sure about that, we'll but if you're, if you're an old school automaker in Detroit, uh, you should be scared to death. Yeah, so let me, let me just go back over the number. 20,000, 2013, 35,000, 2014, and then he wants to maybe make up the difference to make up the 100,000 in the next year, which would be about as much as he's done in the last two years combined it's still a big jump it's not a ridiculous hundred thousand jump but he, they're also working on the uh, the sedan um i believe the sedan is the cheaper one that's going to be thirty five thousand uh, dollars so they have some new models coming out and uh it'll be interesting to watch exactly what goes on there uh, you know when i when i was on um the other day when i was on alt tab 
uh, Jennifer in the background mentioned something, and uh, you know, I'm not sure. I haven't done my own research on it, but she mentioned that uh, creating those lithium-ion batteries uh, actually is is worse for the environment than it would be to drive a gasoline car. So, I mean, one I've heard that battery as well. that's I, I don't know if that's accurate because it's it's one battery that's making that one battery even if it pollutes a lot in the process of making that battery is it really worse than driving a car for several years using gasoline i don't know that's, that's odd. Well, the lithium lithium is a is an un, i mean lithium is insanely bad for the environment especially if it gets into the water table and all this other kind of stuff there there have been a lot of technologies built into batteries to make them quote unquote landfill friendly and recycling friendly um, if you've got a prototype RAV4, I think Toyota experimented with uh, doing electric RAV4s in the late 90s and early 2000s. If you happen to have one of those, the lithium batteries in that have like $10,000 of platinum and lithium in them. So that's worth quite a bit on the recycling market because the price of lithium has gone crazy since then. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's, I've read the same thing. I had uh, uh, BMW Germany, um, I had read like in 2005 they had some sort of like carbon sequestration thing for storing hydrogen safely so that if like a bmw was in a wreck and the tank was punctured it would just slowly leak hydrogen as opposed to turning into a fireball i'd like huh. to see more technology like that as opposed to lithium but the next story is yeah. about a battery life holy grail uh which is they figured out a way to make a lithium anode and battery, which means that it's going to be about a 300% increase in energy density. So if your phone couldn't wait to catch on fire before, it really won't be able to wait to catch on fire now. Yeah, and this this comes from Stanford University. It's kind of funny. I, I would love to, to know more about the environmental impacts on, on all these batteries. Um, but the 400% increase, you, you said 300, but here it says, it says um, 400, 300, 400. It probably, probably vary depending on what you're doing, but yeah. Um, it's 300% increase or 400% of the original value, I guess, right. is what they're saying. Because the, <laughs> the headline is, phones may last 300% longer, but then it says, increase the capacity of existing battery technology 400%. So let's say three to 400%. Yeah. And then, and then we'll see when we really get our hands on one of those and uh, see if they explode in our hands. All right, let's move right along and talk about the Oculus Rift development kit. Um, it, it's kind of interesting. They're using... Uh, the entire screen assembly from a Galaxy Note 2 right in there. They even left the Samsung logo on there. It's just, it's kind of kind of weird. Uh, you figured three. you've been working on, what's that? No, let's say Note, Note 3. three. Let's say 2? Nope. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, but it's it's a, you know, 1080p um, uh, screen, and it's it's they put it in there. And um, I don't know, I figured they would have developed either their own screen or taken <laughs> off the Samsung logo or something. It's just weird. Seems like genius to me. <laughs> yeah. Smack that in there. But, yeah. 19 by 20 by 1080 ammo LED. So, uh, Smash Brothers Brawl on the Oculus Rift. This is why I love PC, man. It's, um, you, you can do just about anything on a PC. You cannot use this with the console. What they've done is they've used the Dolphin emulator, uh, and uh, then they've given it <laughs> Oculus support, and they set up <laughs> Super Smash Brothers to work with the Oculus Rift. I imagine they could do this with other Dolphin uh, games as well. It'd be crazy playing Zelda with an Oculus Rift. Don't we have videos on the channel about how to set up Dolphin and make it awesome? Yeah, but we do. And uh, I might need so to. So you guys some... go check that out. Mm -hmm. And I want to remind everybody: if you guys are trying to play uh, Wii games, you can use your your Wii remote just fine. You can you can get a Wii sensor bar, um, and the Wii sensor bars are. Um, you know, you can get USB ones. They work just fine. But I want to remind everyone, if you guys are going to do this at home, do not sit at your computer as you normally would. You need to scoot back three or four feet from your computer or else it's going to be extremely frustrating. The, the Wii Remote and the sensor bar, they are not designed for you to be like on top of your, your screen or on top of your TV. They're designed for people to sit back on a couch. So it's really frustrating. I was cursing at my screen for like the first day until I backed up away from the computer and I was like, oh, it works perfectly now. But yeah, it was, it was really funny. Anyway, so that's pretty awesome. All right, let's talk about some hardcore hardware. Adata has formally announced their uh, DDR4 SKUs. Right there they are. We saw some DDR4 SKUs in the wild. The first, uh, I believe they were the first 
SKUs or the first um, actual uh, DIMMs that were, you know, available to the public or available to show to the public that were actually working. I don't know. We saw them at Computex. So there they are, right there on the screen. I'm getting ready for X99. Is that going to be your new platform, you think, Wendell? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Looks like, looks like we're all moving to X99. And um, my, my work machine is still a Sandy Bridge 6 core. It gets the job done. It does. <clears throat> you know, um, Pistol, she's uh, still using the uh, AMD, uh, she's got the I don't know, 9590, I guess. And I've maybe talked her into upgrading the X99 unless AMD announces something amazing. She, she really loves her AMD system, mainly because it makes a lot of the fanboys just, uh, just freaking religiously angry. It's, it's almost funny. <laughs> All she has to do is say, yeah, I'm running AMD uh, graphics card and an AMD CPU, and they, something happens inside them. And they can't contain themselves, and they start spouting these just these hilarities. That they sound like they sound like insane religious zealots. <laughs> yeah, it's free entertainment for her. <laughs> we should we should set her up with a dual socket Opteron. Dual we'll socket Opteron, yeah. <laughs> can, can you game on a dual socket Opteron? I mean, oh yes, yeah. The Opteron will have no problems. You you could throw in a couple of two ninety Xs. It's got all the PCI Express lanes and all the features. Really? Dual Opteron? How would you like a dual <laughs> server? <laughs> As if she's not already pulling enough power with that 220 watt whatever um, <laughs> TDP CPU. Uh, we yeah. can upgrade her to the uh, Fractal Arc XL. We'll be all set. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Alright, moving along here. Um, NVIDIA. Speaking of, speaking of AMD, NVIDIA, <laughs> the GTX 880. Um, apparently, they're going to be releasing a paper in September and possibly launching in October. And uh, I think the Gigabyte stuff, they announced uh, their version, the gaming, what was it the G1 or the gaming, whatever. That's going to be yeah, coming G1. out possibly in early October, late September. Could be crazy. Now, the GTX 880, um, it does not look like it's going to be, um, I, I guess, a full replacement for the, the 780. Uh, tie, but um, the price is going to be lower, and uh, you know it's going to be built on current architecture. So if you want the uh, GM200, uh, this is not going to be that part, but it's still going to be really fast. I think I'm thinking I'm just going to guess right now that this is probably going to replace like the 770, maybe be about as fast as the 780-ish, but it's going to be cheaper, 450 to 400 dollars somewhere in that range. Um, I don't know. And this is I'm a really waiting good strategy. on the 880 tie. Go ahead. I mean, it, it's. Okay, let's. We don't know anything about Nvidia. We're just guessing here. Their strategy may be to try to come out with a middle of the road or mainstream card before the flagship card, because you know there's not really AMD's not really knocking down their door with their next generation stuff yet. So this may give Nvidia a chance for them to get you know a new process lined out or new core or new software or new software plus core plus architecture or a lot of these things that are in flux or it may give them a chance to ramp up like vram production if it's going to be totally different vram we don't we don't know any details on this platform what it's going to be anything i think that as a general strategy if you do the middle of the road cards first that'll let you really make sure that you dot all your i's and cross all your t's with the flagship cards and i hope that's what they're doing here because when the 780 first launched there were issues i mean in the benchmarks that we did the the uh you know the brand new out of the box drivers when we first benchmarked them compared to today and a lot of games a lot of games today are 10 percent faster than they were way back then and so this might give them a chance to to line out those issues before they launch the flagship card yeah and again the flagship card is probably going to be on the uh the newer architecture as well so maybe they're maybe they're still working on that you know, the, you know the GTX 880. Maybe, maybe let's say maybe it is as fast as a 780 Ti, which would be insane. That would be great for the price. That would be unbelievable, and that would allow them to really, really go crazy with the 880 Ti. So we'll just have to wait and see what goes on there. I'm just thinking at that price point, it's it's got to be around the performance of a 780, maybe a little better, but not too much better. Maybe maybe it's going to be crazier. I don't know. Who knows? All right, moving right along here. AMD's got some announcements as well. They have some new CPUs coming out. Uh, the Athlon 860K and the FX8300. And they're, these are both going to be, uh, I believe, FM2 um, stuff. I really like the FM2 motherboards. They're really loaded with a lot of cool features. Uh, they seem to update their FM2 stuff more often than they update their you know, their AM3 stuff. I'm not sure if we'll see much more with the AM3. I don't know. Maybe, maybe one of these days we'll see something else in that. 
in that line. But um, what we have here, we have the uh, the new APUs, 28 nanometer, of course, um, and they're 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 based on uh, Kavari. So um, I don't know. Just it's it's the main the main thing here is probably going to be a little it's probably going to be a little bit faster, and it's going to be more energy efficient. They've really done a lot with their um, you know the efficiency of these chips. So I don't know. Well, the the eighty three hundred, I think, is AM three plus. Is it? And yeah, and it's uh, clocked at three point two to three point five, uh, three point five for the turbo. Oh right, and, right. Uh, that, yep. That's uh, eight cores. Now the AMD also released new APU, but those were I think we reported on that already, but maybe not. Yeah. Think, okay. The yeah. official announcement was on the thirty first, but I think we we were like, oh my god! But the eighty three hundred is a AM three plus sort of refresh. Yep. But it's totally. it's eight core. It could be good. I mean, we'll see how fast it is. It's not, uh, the, the clocks are not as crazy as, as some of the, the current stuff that's out there, but if the price is right, you know, and uh, yeah, it's, it's Vishra. I, I totally missed that. It must be uh, this migraine. <laughs> it's gone away, <laughs> but all day long I've been, ooh. Um, it's, and, uh, the, the TDP is also 95 watts, which is, you know, yeah, that's not great. completely insane. That's like for, the, it's not 95.90 country. <laughs> yeah. For, for one of those things, that is... That's that's unbelievable, actually, and I mean, for gaming, if okay, if they get the price right on this thing, and you know, if um, well, the power consumption's already down, uh, even if it's a little slower than the current eighty three fifty or whatever, um, it, it could be a really good way to go, and maybe I'll end up re recommending that a lot because for me, with the gaming machine, you want a decent CPU and a really good GPU. So if it's decent and priced right, I'll condone it. All right. Uh, AMD has also released um, some free sync information as a as an FAQ. So this this is kind of interesting here, um, but yeah, it's still still this is still pretty much the same technology as adaptive VSync and uh, what Nvidia is calling G Sync. Guys, the only difference in G Sync and adaptive VSync and free sync is the color. It's green. That's it. Like stop <laughs> stop sending stop sending mail saying that it's better because Nvidia because it's just really the same thing. Come on. <laughs> it, and by the same thing we mean the end result is the same not that the middle innered bits are the same because the middle innered bits are no those are not the same at all you got to have with g-sync you got to have some some wibbly wobbly giggly gook inside the <laughs> monitor and it's just not a good situation as far as that goes oh god the, yes, the, <laughs> the giggly gook 9000 is what powers this <laughs> wow but there's a the the frequently this is important because it's an actual frequently asked questions page about this on amd's website and so it's like oh it's a finally a legit thing but one of the questions is how is it different and the answer is there are key advantages to project FreeSync over g-sync no licensing fees for adoptions no expense over proprietary hardware modules no communication overhead Ta -da! that pretty much sums it up yeah yeah i love the part i love the fact that it is part of the uh, the standard for displayport 1.2a so yes Gonna be good. Technically, it was it was part of Visa way back in the day, but then they were like, "Wait, we need this still in DisplayPort." So they're like, "All right, here you go." <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're using this for for laptop monitors for a long time. It all started as a power consumption thing. So now it's uh now it's gonna be everywhere. You know what I'm wondering? Because you know, I've just bought four more of these Korean monitors, and the video is coming really soon. And uh, I really, really, really like these X Stars. Like, they're awesome. I'm using the first one right here in the middle, but the one you guys are seeing over there with Wendell on it. That's the X Star. Uh, the first one here is uh, awesome for the um, all the connections and all that stuff. But the backlight bleed is a little bit crazy on that one, like crazier than any monitor I've used. So <laughs> is that the AHVA or the Samsung mm -hmm. IPS? No, no, that's the uh, the Super IPS. Um, oh, okay. The, it, it's uh, the first uses a Super IPS, and uh, the colors are great. Like, and the picture actually looks really good. But whenever you're doing something and it's dark, uh, down toward the corner. Uh, on the left side, it is just like extreme backlight bleed. The X stars are like what you would expect normally from you know any regular inexpensive monitor. Um, but the I don't know maybe maybe this something went went wrong with this first monitor. The backlight bleed is really bad. Didn't even notice it until I started watching a movie or like brought up a movie and then you know you saw the it was a letterbox movie and you saw I saw the you know the dark in the corner and I was like whoa. That's a bit crazy. I, I didn't notice it while I was playing Quake. Didn't notice it while I was editing videos or anything like that. So, I don't know. It's probably going to move from the middle to over to the side, and the, uh, the X Star there is going to become the primary monitor, even though it's cheaper and it's just it just has the one you know uh, dual link 
DVI port doesn't have the HDMI and all that. This you know, the first thing has every port imaginable, even component. Um, but yeah, the the X Star is definitely going to be my main display. I love that. I love that Samsung PLS panel. It is beautiful. Anyway, that was a tangent. And we've and also half. we've also got the review on the AHVA coming up, which is another kind of panel, which is cheaper and not as terrible as TN. Not quite as good as IPS, but way cheaper. Yeah, that's all been shot actually, and Jimmy edited it. The only thing that I haven't put in there is I didn't notice how bad the back uh, light bleed was, so I told him to stop. And I'm going to get some video footage of the, the backlight bleed on this one and put that in the video as well. But other than that, everything's ready for all of these monitors. So you guys will see those soon. But the reason I even brought this up is I'm wondering, um, you know, I'm wondering if, if we'll be able to get monitors like this from Korea that also uh, work with DisplayPort 1.2. And I wonder how long that's going to be. We should start calling some people over there because... I don't know. I'm really, I'm really spoiled by this Korean monitor setup. You know, you just call them up or whatever, and you're like, "Hey!" And then four days later, you get a box, of, a whole bunch of Korean monitors for like three hundred bucks a pop. We are yeah. working on a deal awesome. with Dream Seller on eBay for you guys, and so we will be able to send you to the eBay store, and he will take care of you, and it will be amazing. Yeah, they, they, they should they should guarantee pixel purpose for uh, for people who entered Tech Syndicate as a, a, a code or something. We should call them. Hmm. Well, hmm. I mean, given that the reject monitors are, uh, uh, we don't we don't necessarily have control over that because sometimes the reject monitor is that you've got a bad pixel here and there. But the uh, you know the IPS panels that we've gotten from Dell, so we're getting some of the Dell 4K IPS panels, and the backlight bleed on those has been insane. And then we've also got some other name brand uh, backlight uh, monitors with backlight bleed that are not the Korean monitors. They're just regular old, uh, you know, American brand, uh, you know, 2560 by 1440 and 1080p, and the backlight bleed on those has been insane. So it must be something in the manufacturing process because the older IPS panels didn't seem to have bleed that bad. Yeah. Weird. All right, well, let's, uh, let's move on, and um, we're, we're going to talk a bit about some CPUs, like the Pentium G3258. Tom's Hardware here has an interesting article up. Uh, and what they're doing is they're just comparing the performance of an overclocked G3258 uh, to some of the other uh, slightly more expensive CPUs out there. Because um, it's cheap. That's the, that's the bottom line here. A lot of people are going to be building gaming PCs. It's getting toward the end of the year. Uh, we're going to have some tutorial videos on how to build three and five hundred dollar, you know, kill your console type gaming computers. And, um, and I'm not sure if we're going to be using this CPU or not. Maybe I, I still kind of lean towards... The uh, the AMD X4 750K, just I, I like yeah. that one a lot. But um, yeah, it really sucks that the Pentium is only dual core. If it was not, so like we've got to give you guys a preview of some upcoming videos. The Pentium works well. So like if you want to build a Steam box, build a really really cheap like dirt cheap uh, machine to use as a uh, you know big picture Steam box where you're streaming from another home computer. You could totally do that, and that'll and that's fine. And we do we got a video coming up on that. But the big thing with this is you can you can overclock the Dickens out of it, and so you can get pretty good performance. But for you know some of the AM2 and especially the 8300 that just came out, you get a lot more horsepower from a solution like that than you do from the Pentium. And so it's really I mean unless you just want to be on Team Blue, it's really hard to recommend that when there are other options available. Now you can get more features on the Intel platform, especially if you go Z97. But some of these motherboard manufacturers are coming out with really amazing solid boards that have a ton of features but are based on other chipsets like, you know, H91 or I don't know the chipset numbers off the top of my head. But those uh, chipsets are not Z97, but they still have figured out a way to sort of backdoor unlock overclocking features. And man, you can get some, You can, I mean, for, you know, $130 for the CPU and the motherboard, it's crazy. Yeah, the, there's um, been some deals on Newegg lately, actually, and I, I picked up one yesterday. I believe it was this CPU. I have to double check because I just bought it. It was uh, this CPU uh, coupled together with a, a B85 motherboard from MSI, and that's a business class motherboard that you can actually use for overclocking. So that and it's got a lot of good features on it. So I, it's I was like, okay, cool. This is 100 bucks. I'm gonna grab this, and that takes care of the you know decent motherboard and a, and a you know CPU that can that can game. And I'm gonna see what I can put together with that, with you know some inexpensive RAM and uh, decent yet uh, inexpensive graphics card. See what I can do. All so right. We got a lot of reviews on this stuff coming up, and it's gonna be nuts. Yep. We've also got the Devil's Canyon Redux, which is 
you know, how did the, how's the overclocking work and all this kind of stuff. So basically we've been able to show that the overclocking on Z97 is basically identical to Z87 in terms of all of the CPU features and all the stuff. But we had to check that 87 times because everybody was reporting, oh, it doesn't overclock as good on Z97, but we haven't been able to replicate that. All right, let's uh, go ahead and scare the hell out of everybody. Um, USB, there's a new USB, um, not virus, but it's a bit of malware. And um, normally, you know, you get a virus on a USB stick, you can just format it or whatever, wipe it all, you know, wipe it all and it'll be fine. This one does not u live in that part of the USB stick. This one lives in the actual firmware, so you can't get rid of it. So if you uh, put your USB stick into an unprotected slot that it, um, that it you know, has some malware on it, it's pretty much, you gotta throw it away. Start all over. So and it's like, it, how does this work? Yeah. It also lives in the, in the controller on the, I mean, pretty much lives in like, uh, it'll, it'll infect the computer and the USB stick. So this is like a USB STD. <laughs> right now, the level of complexity for doing this is that you, you would pretty much need to have, you know, like the NSA or somebody after you. And so this might be some of the $10,000 USB cables that we reported way back when. But, so this thing is, is not, not defined, you know, how does this work? Well, a lot of USB controllers are actually a PC inside the cable. It's not really a PC, but there's like a microprocessor with RAM and flash storage and things like that inside the USB controller. So on a flash drive, you'll have a, you know, an intelligent controller. We always talk about how, you know, you got Sandforce or Marvell or something like that on like a SATA flash drive. Well, it's the same deal. It's just inside a USB controller. Apple, they've gone completely insane. Uh, so with their, their, their lightning connector, when you want to do like HDMI out, it does like an H.264 stream to a chip in the cable who then converts it to HDMI. And of course the chip's programmable and, and all that stuff. That's not exactly USB, but same deal. Companies, it's gotten so cheap that the companies are putting all this hardware inside the cable and now that can be exploited. And so, well, how would that infect the computer? And it's like, well, the controller is smart enough to know what files you're writing. And so you could save a a file to your computer and then it could rename it to an exe if it understands file systems and put malicious code on it so that when you run something it would then infect your computer with the desktop computer version of that virus this is really scary stuff it's proof of concept and they're they're being really light on details so i'm just going to go ahead and say that i suspect that the exploits here are going to be dependent on the controller. Being familiar with USB controllers, like it's based on the Intel 8051 controller, uh, 8051 CPU a lot of the time. So there may be some universal vulnerability in like Intel 8051 microcode with in terms of like how it stores things or how it works on stuff. They also didn't name the company or companies that they work with, but I suspect, but I don't know, not 100% sure, but I suspect that one of the companies that are, is going to be affected by this is Fison. Fison makes uh, USB controllers. They're programmable. I've played with them. I've done actually a lot of work with a Fison controller and custom software. And it's pretty easy to load your stuff onto the controller and, and do whatever you want. But, but not all of them are programmable. Some of them use a mask ROM. So you, and what that means is you can program it one time and then you're done. And so I don't think that this vulnerability is as bad as they make it out to be. But there are a lot of devices that have programmable controllers, and this could be a very serious issue. I mean, how, how, can, you, how can you tell if your device has a programmable controller or not? Like, is there... <laughs> yeah, you don't know. You like, yeah, like I mean, the, look in up manufacturing, they can switch parts. I mean, in the first thousand... Like, let's say that you're a flash drive maker, and I'm going to make a new 16-gig flash drive that's better than everybody else's. My first 10,000 might have a programmable controller, and let's say they sell really well, so I want to put in a 100,000 unit order. I might switch from a programmable to a mask ROM, which is mm -hmm. a, a more of a setup cost up front, but a lower part cost when I'm talking about 100,000 units or a million units. And so it'll have the same part number, same assembly process, same warehouse distribution. You don't know if it's programmable or not. You'll just probably... Uh, there are tools that can be built to do that, but because these are all used like on the manufacturing and assembly line, there's no easy way to tell at all right now, universally. All right, let's talk about science, shall we? Um, NASA, they've confirmed their quote-unquote impossible uh, space drive. So for, for years now, um, there's been a British scientist by the name of Roger uh, Shawyer, and uh, he, he created something called the EM drive, or the M drive, I'm not sure how, how you say it, EM drive or M drive, but anyway, it's based on relativity. 
and um, it, it he basically it, it's a propeller it's a propellantless thrust system that bounces microwaves around in a closed container to provide you with the um, the thrust and you know, scientists in America were like, that's nonsense. That's not it's just nonsense. And in order for something to be validated, it does need to be, um, you know, re- something that's repeatable. And no one else really did any tests. And then some Chinese scientists were like, okay, l- let's test it out. And they did it and they're like, hey, it works. And nobody seemed to care. I don't know why. But finally, finally, someone in the USA decided to test it out. Uh, Guido Feta. Uh, built his own system using you know the same technology, and then presented it to NASA. NASA and they tested it out, and they're like, "Holy crap! This thing that everyone says works works." <laughs> so that's that's the short version of it. Um, <laughs> it's go ahead. Well, it's slightly weirder than that. I mean, it is that is exactly what it is. And so, how crazy is this? You got to understand that we don't have any kind of propellantless maneuvering anything like there doesn't exist today that we know of except for this maybe a thing that would allow something in space to move around that doesn't involve expelling particles right. so you even shoot, like the ion drive fire. everything's got a fuel yeah you gotta you gotta shoot fire out the back or shoot wind out the back or i mean jet skis shoot well, everything pushes something out the back or you know <laughs> and then pushes them forward there's and and I uh, the people have already started commenting. What about solar cells, you idiot? And it's like, okay, yeah, solar cells, big giant cell bouncing photons off of it, and you know, but you're using someone else's thrust in that case, and that's not really going to help you all that much when you get far away from the sun. Although it would a little bit, I guess. But so this thing is kind of crazy because there's not really a an explanation in classical physics. There can only be an expl- explanation in quantum mechanical physics and the best guess is that the the quantum vacuum of empty space which means that there because there's background energy means that particles are popping into existence and then disappearing that those particles that are popping into existence and disappearing in the chamber um, are the things that are being acted upon by the energy inside the chamber and so this means that this propulsion device may actually push on the uh quantum vacuum which is completely insane and it should also be noted that the chinese test and the european guy got significantly more threat thrust than nasa but uh if you look at other articles on this one warning is that um a lot of uh places are misreporting that a a quote-unquote dismantled version of this drive was also exerting thrust and that's not actually accurate the uh, fortunately, I've got access to the original article, which is behind a paywall, which is something Aaron Schwartz died to try to prevent so that everybody could read it and understand it. And so, ordin- you know, plebeians can't get to it. You've got to go through a university or a higher education or whatever. And so it's kind of funny because uh, Guido Feta calls this the, the canna drive, as in, I canna do it, Captain. I canna change the laws of physics. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he doesn't really mean that, but. He probably does. He probably does. Um, I think he does. <laughs> so it's really, really interesting in that we may actually have a propulsion system that doesn't involve um, expelling particles. I mean, in terms of like satellites in orbit, this would be a great system to take solar energy, solar electricity, and turn it into a form of propulsion. But the amount of thrust it exerts is very, very small. So not very practical. But if this actually is validated, um, it could be a huge thing. And like the, the dummy apparatus, they created something that uh, uh, had a dummy load on it, which would create an induced magnetic field, and that actually did produce some thrust. So the dummy device produced some thrust, but not as much thrust as the device that uh, was supposed to really actually produce thrust. And so the NASA experiments at least took into account energy dissipation and an induced electromagnetic field and how that might actually produce thrust against the earth's magnetic field or ambient electromagnetic field or or whatever and the 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 uh microwave drive produced more thrust so i don't know need more data yeah all right well this uh this medicine from the migraine stuff is making me uh funny (laughs) <laughs> we're 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 gonna get through this, guys. But uh, if you got if you notice that I'm turning pale, it's the uh, the medicine from the migraine stuff. It's making me loopy. 
Um, the Army is printing, and this, this is gonna make me feel really good. The Army is printing, or is, is working on a 3D printer to make food. We got some 3D printer stuff coming up right now. And uh, yeah, this is exactly what I do not wanna think about right now, now that my stomach's upside down from this medicine, is 3D printed weird food. Um, but yeah, there's some researchers in, in Massachusetts, um, and they are working on pretty much ruggedized, military-grade uh, 3D food printers so that when you're out there in the field, you can have a sandwich, or you can have pizza, or you can have pasta, or you can have, I don't know, whatever you want. Um, 3D, 3D printed for food, it's a thing. I mean, there's already, this technology already exists. But I guess they're just making it for the for the military now. It's and it's also interesting because you know if you're finding that certain soldiers have vitamin deficiencies in some areas, you can say like, oh, this guy needs more vitamin D, and you can put all that into the you know the right into the food. Um, and I've also seen them use this uh, this sort of thing medically to wean people off of things like salt. You know, you're too much salt, so you give them slight like tiny tiny bit uh, less salt every day until they're almost eating no salt, and their taste buds don't even notice it that much. So. Interesting stuff here. Um, I mean, nothing yet. They're just working on it. It's not a, it's not a finished, done thing. So, all right. Uh, the other three D printing that's pretty exciting. Three D printed concrete. So, a man is printing a castle <laughs> in his garden using a concrete three D printer that he invented. Let's go ahead and play this video here because it's crazy to watch. But yeah. And we've, we've seen these, of course, used in construction, but it's interesting that this dude just built this one. And it's uh, similar to a lot of the ones that they're using in Denmark and China. But yeah, pretty nice. I don't know, you, do you want to get one of these concrete I would 3D like printers? To, I, would, I would. It's sort of fun. And it's always, it's always an interesting situation when somebody that has a will and, you know, it's just a random person and not a corporation with millions of dollars of R&D is able to say, oh yeah, this is a good idea. Let's actually build this. And he does. Because, I mean, this printer, even though it's not super sophisticated in terms of like, you know, one and two story houses and, and dwelling, you know, like a typical family dwelling, this thing could crank those things out all day long, which is really awesome. Yeah, I mean, he was saying that his goal is to make uh, good, affordable houses in 24 hours. So yeah, very interesting. I just don't like the aesthetic, you know. <laughs> I think they're. I always think these things are ugly. You'd have to do something to the outside of the house. A little stucco goes a long way. Yeah. <laughs> just stick it with stucco. That's that's their slogan, I think. Or you, you know, right. veneer brick. I mean, one guy with some veneer bricks could totally go nuts with this, and it's got a texture that the veneer adhesive material would totally stick to with the. Oh, little, I would love that. Yeah. The little ribs from the the passes on the 3D printer. There could be a guy with a trowel going behind this thing, smoothing it out. I mean, that's that's an option. Yeah, or they could. That's what they need. They need a robotic trowel to, to trail behind it and just smooth it out. <laughs> Wait a minute, we should uh, patent that quickly, <laughs> quickly before someone else does. NASA, their next rover, is going to uh, generate oxygen and uh, collect some rocks to bring back to Earth. So um, the next rover is going to be around. Is going to be heading over there. At about 2020, uh, you know we should be on the moon already, but uh, I'll let Neil De Neil deGrasse Tyson fight that battle. He's in a better position than I am, but yeah, we should I mean, we should we should be we should be on the moon and we should be ready to go and colonize Mars. But we're not, so we'll have to send rovers that can generate oxygen. But it would be interesting um, to see what we can do with a rover that makes oxygen. I mean, I'm not sure exactly what their overall goals are for this for this mission, but let me just open up this picture here and get a shot of the rover there. Interesting. I don't know. Anything, anything else you want to add to this other than the fact that it's kind of cool? We're still sending rovers to Mars. Anything like that is to be encouraged. Yeah. At least we're still doing something here. I don't know. What we need some we need some motivation for the freaking politicians, you know, to to fund NASA. Uh, what can we <laughs> use to blowing things up? Maybe. No, we've already figured this out. It's like scientists. You guys need to all conspire together to say that there's oil on Mars. And then we'll bring democracy to Mars tomorrow. We're going to liberate Mars. <laughs> the, the, Mars needs some liberty right now. Um, <laughs> oil, oil and gold and, and natural gas and diamonds. All of those things. It's like, oh, it turns out that Mars is one giant diamond that we can just mine. So we'll be there tomorrow. Well, maybe not diamonds, but maybe gold. I don't know. 
Now, along the lines of uh, what we were just talking about, Bigelow Space Industries, or Bigelow Aerospace, um, they plan to send up colonies to the moon. And uh, the human colonies, yes. I mean, the, the, this article is very, very light on, um, on details. There's, there's an infographic here with plenty of details. That didn't work out at all. But... And there's also a video here. And you guys can go and watch that. But it's interesting that the private sector is having to do this. And I, I'm all for the private sector doing this as long as they're doing it uh, with science as the main goal and not uh, some other corporate, you know, money-making scheme or whatever. But, uh, you know, SpaceX, uh, Bigelow, Aerospace, other companies like that, um, it looks like they're going to be the ones on Mars first before NASA. I mean, not on Mars, on, on the moon first. Hmm, Interesting. 18 teams are currently competing to win up to 30 million as part of the X Prize, which will be awarded the first private team that successfully launches an unmanned mission to the moon and meets a set of objectives. So there's this article on Wired about building materials from light that could lead to invisibility cloaks. And so it's like, we're one step closer to creating invisibility cloaks thanks to researchers from Cambridge, again, who have just published a study detailing how to build materials with light. And so this is an interesting article that goes into uh, basically just building uh, materials actually from light and how it can be used to coat a fighter jet or something like that and basically render it effectively invisible. That sounds like fun. It could uh, be I wanna, fun. I want to get some of that and just put it on my legs and then sprint all over town freaking people out. It's a floating torso. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of the medicine talking. All right, anyway. Um, Let's take a look at um, some amazing Minecraft creations. We're going to talk about gaming for just a little bit. And then as soon as I'm done here, they're going to film Lost. So you guys have a lot of gaming to look forward to this week. Um, this, this video, guys, I just recommend that you guys go check this out. The, some of the stuff that people are creating in Minecraft is unbelievable. Um, yeah, it, it's uh, all entries in, um, in Planet Minecraft's Head into the Clouds contest. So it's some of the stuff that's just unbelievable. I don't I play saw Minecraft, a, but, but I saw yes. a creation, recreation of King's Landing in, in Minecraft, and it was amazing. It was an, yeah, it was an incredible I saw that too, work. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was uh, not too long ago that it came out. But yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of really interesting projects here. So yeah, it's, it's totally unbelievable what people are doing in Minecraft. All right. Uh, last thing to talk about, Beyond Good and Evil 2 is still happening. It's been delayed and delayed and maybe not going to happen, and then they released a video of it a year or so ago. Um, but Ubisoft CEO said something. <laughs> it's the last article. I can get through this before I'm ill. Um, let's see, where is it? Ubisoft is unfortunately still involved, and so I have my doubts. Yeah. When, when the first Beyond Good and Evil came out, I was like, God, it was amazing. But Ubisoft, you know, lately, you guys, your shenanigans with Watch Dogs, freaking DRM schemes, bait and switch, just all this kind of stuff is worrying me. So, yeah, I'm a little bit worried about this game, too. But, but you know, the the freaking creator, Ansel, he's, he's awesome. Anyway, so, yeah, it's about time for me to go lay down. <laughs> I think I've had enough activities for today. Oh, man. And uh, if... Uh, what else do we have? Any more announcements? I'm quite out of it. You literally only have hours left to enter the contest. So go to the site and enter the contest. Yes, right here. Lots of ways to win this contest. And, of course, you get bonus entries for being a subscriber to Tech Syndicate. And then all the Facebook things. Share this right here. This is a really good way to get extra entries. Sharing this... Uh, you know, when you share this and someone else enters you get extra entries. So you can get a gazillion entries if you just keep sharing this. So do it like crazy right now. And uh, yeah, that's it. All right. End of the show. Goodbye. Hope you enjoyed it. I, I guess. <laughs> that's hard for me to be disingenuous. <laughs> we could... Uh, well, I, mean, I don't know. It's fine. We st we've also got... We've got one really insanely esoteric video coming up on repairing an NTFS file system using DD. But oh yeah, that's, that's ready. I just have to upload it i don't know i mean it's not it's so it's so out in left field everybody's gonna be like what is what is this they're gonna enjoy what it is, what are you doing i'm telling them right now you guys are gonna enjoy this you have no choice you better enjoy this all no, right it's bad it's, it's, it's awesome, awesome. <laughs> all right see you guys later